So I'm Rhonda Henry, and I'm going to be sitting for most of our time because I've hurt my knee. So I'm sorry about that. And I usually like to stand, but it's just not in the cards today. We'll see if I can do this. In just a moment. Oh, Tammy, we should have practiced that part. Okay. There we go. I'm here today to talk to you all about um, relationships and how they impact our well-being. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I love just everything related to how we intersect with other folks um, and then what that brings into our life and what we can bring into other people's lives. When I'm talking about relationships today, I'm using that term very broadly. So not just romantic relationships. We're going to be referring all of these same concepts will apply in romantic relationships or partnerships um, with family members, with friends, with coworkers. So lots of different relationships, these same kind of um, general sort of principles can be applied in those different situations, even when there's a different level of connection or intimacy. I want this to be somewhat interactive, so I've got some spaces where I'll ask you guys questions or for some input, um, but I also want this to be meaningful to you. So if you have questions as we go along, please stop me. I want us to, again, be able to engage just in a conversation about this and get to that next deeper level of understanding. So I'm with the Office of Work Life. Um, I'm one of the therapists there at the office, along with Anne, who's the other therapist, my counterpart there. Um, and then we also have a variety of other as we go through, you'll see our website at the bottom if you're interested in looking at any additional information. Um, and we're going to get going. So let's talk for a second about the benefits of, health, of a healthy relationship. And healthy being the key word in all of this that we're talking about, okay? A healthy relationship. That connection and again, it shows up in lots of different ways and spaces, but these are the things consistently that research shows that benefits of those healthy relationships that we're going to find in our day-to-day -day lives. I was interested in this piece about the research around relationships and thriving. It was a particular study I was looking at, and it was, it was considering these five aspects of thriving. This idea, again, you'll see kind of some overlay with those, the ones that I just had up a second ago. Happiness and life satisfaction having purpose and meaning in life and progressing toward meaningful life goals. Okay, psychological well-being, social well-being, and physical well-being. Again, we see the overlap with the other research that we had there. This idea of thriving, you know, how do we, to me that, that speaks more to that growth mindset. You know, how are we growing? Who are we becoming? What do we want to do? So we're not just surviving things, but we're actually kind of in our best um, space to thrive and to learn and grow in new ways. So the ultimate kind of research piece they did came up with these two um, ways that positive relationships fuel thriving in two different ways. One being a catalyst for thriving through life opportunities. What does that mean? Meaning when, um, when things are okay, having connection to other people helps us move to sort of the next level in, in what we're able to do. So it might be having a friend who encourages us to try new things, folks who travel with us, folks who, you know, encourage us to go back to school or take a class or expand our knowledge or our skill set in some way. So even when things are really good, having those positive relationships can move us to kind of that next level that we might want to be at. On the other side of that, those relationships motivate thriving through adversity. And most of us know what that feels like. When we're having a hard time, when we're dealing with family loss, those kinds of things, having friends or having support folks who can help us in those difficult times. If we're going through a breakup, having support folks in our family, our friend circle, we know that can help us through adversity so that it's not just something's gone wrong and I'm shutting down. It's having that person to encourage, you know, let's get out of the house. Let's go do something. Let's try this again. You didn't get that job, but you know, you're really good at this. Let's look, let's look for something else. Let's see what's next in life. And it came down to what to me seemed like just the simplest idea that healthy relationships help us when things are good and when things are bad. Like, again, that seems like the simplest, most straightforward thing. No matter what's going on in our lives, having healthy connections with folks is what's going to help us get from where we are to maybe where we want to be. So let's talk for a minute about what works in a healthy relationship when it's working and when it's not. So I've got a couple things up here, but I'm going to ask for a few things from you all as well. So some signs of good, healthy relationships. Strong communication, mutual respect, healthy boundaries, trust and honesty. Those are the ones that I started with. We're going to touch more on communication and boundaries in particular in a few minutes. But what else for you is a sign of a healthy relationship, an aspect of a healthy relationship? So things that are feeling one-sided or selfish. You know, we've, I think, probably all had that friend that calls and it's like, you'll never believe what's happening to me. Yeah. 
okay, good conversation. Talk to you later, you know? Things that feel superficial. This one I wanna say a little bit more about. Not every relationship we have is gonna be our best, deepest, truest friend in the world. Okay, some folks we have a social relationship with, you know, we know them, we see them, we speak to them on campus. That's completely fine. I'm talking about when it's something that, in terms of those meaningful, deeper relationships, if we're connecting on just a superficial level, when we're not actually getting to what really connects us to folks, okay? Abusive or degrading relationships. When, that, when I put that one up, what comes to mind for you guys? I mean, I think for lots of us, we envision domestic violence, you know, that sort of, we go to that end of it. But it can also show up as things like people making fun of things about you that you don't really find funny. You know, this is always the joke that a friend tells when we get together or a story that was really embarrassing or hurtful and they don't think about how that makes me feel, you know, or when they introduce me to somebody, they add some, you know, some description of me that makes me seem a certain way to that person I'm meeting. So again, there's a whole continuum of behavior. Yes, of course, violent and, and domestic violence and abusive um, behavior in that way is obviously problematic, but there's kind of a whole range of things that can fall into that sort of abusive or degrading interactions. And sometimes habit just keeps us from recognizing that it's problematic. Whoops. It's, Tammy, it's not, I'm doing that thing it's supposed to do. Anything else that are signs of problematic relationships? We'll try this. So anything else that comes to mind when you think about problematic aspects that would show up in a relationship? Say, that, say a little more about that. Yeah, so that sort of prioritizing piece and yeah, whether you're, you're kind of seeing that or whatever's going on in that moment. Yeah, any other things that come to mind? So let's talk about, we're gonna really hone in on two areas, communication and boundaries, because those really in any kind of relationship, getting a handle on those two areas can make a significant difference in the quality of how that relationship goes. So when we talk about this, what does good communication look like? So again, I've got a couple ideas that I'm putting up. There we go. So it's mutual, you know, one person's not dominating. It's not the, hey, here's all my problems. Talk to you later. It's honest, Now that doesn't mean we say everything all the time, but there's, there's opportunity to be honest when you decide you need that, and it's safe to be honest. Timely, what I mean by that is we're not kind of holding on to all these past hurts for a long time. You know, I've certainly seen it in my life of, you know, someone who won't address a problem when it comes up, um, and we used to call it stamp collecting, and I don't know that anybody like even stamp collects anymore, so they don't even know what that means, but you know, this idea that like, okay, I put another one in the book, and I put another one in the book, and oh, you did that wrong, put another one in the book, and then one day, we blow up, or we can't take it anymore, and so we've not given somebody those cues along the way, I don't like what's going on, or this doesn't feel good to me, or this hurts my feelings when you do, whatever, we're just sort of setting on those things, we don't address them in a timely way, and then typically we get frustrated, resentful, and hurt, and it kind of blows up. Um, listening for understanding. I know, you know, I'm not, oh, and that is a struggle for me sometimes because I will get anxious, especially if it's a high stakes conversation and I'll start worrying about what am I going to say? How do I express what I want to express in the way that gets it across? And I get so much in my head doing that, that I'm not really listening to the other person. I'm looking at their facial expression or seeing kind of what the body is that's, that's going on there. So slowing down enough to listen, to understand, and that's honestly, I think one of the biggest ones on that list. That idea of kind of practicing the pause, those two kind of go hand in hand. You know, not getting on a roll where, um, does anybody find themselves when it's a difficult you're worried about going into, that you just fill the space with more and more words, and we're just talking and we're talking, and it's so much, and we're saying so many things, and the little nugget kind of getting lost in there. The little things that we're actually trying to get to sometimes get lost in there. Pausing, slowing down, being quiet for a minute. Um, how many folks, when you think about how you process things, how many of you um, would say that you're more in that vein of you kind of, your mind gets going, you're brainstorming something, you're kind of popping with ideas, you're kind of a quick thinker in that way. You like to process externally, sort of pop off things, you know, some folks, and sometimes some circumstances more than others. Some folks relate more to, I need some time to think about it. 
I need to process a little bit. I need to think about what you said and how I want to respond and what that means to me. And so they may be sitting in a group, really kind of sitting back a little bit. They may never be the one that kind of gets to jump in with some ideas because they're thinking and processing. Doesn't mean they're not, they don't have stuff to contribute, but that shows up again in our one-on-one -on -one relationships and group settings that we have as well. So practicing the pause a little bit. If you know that you're one that kind of more quickly goes from one thing to the next, slowing it down just a little bit, you know, giving the other person time to sort of think and catch up and be a part of the meaningful part of that conversation. Um, I statements. I think we hear this one a whole lot, um, or at least I felt like I got hit over the head with this when I went through school, you know, I statements, everything's me and I, and that should be the start of everything that you're wanting to address, you know, it's about me and what I'm, where I'm coming from. I think it's a whole lot easier to think about it than to how to put that in practice, you know, so how do I actually turn that around and use that? We're going to do some practice rounds with that in a second uh, with a couple of examples um, that we've referenced a little bit earlier. So what are some of the barriers to, to communicating? And this is where I want to hear from you all a little bit before I pop up some answers. So what is it that keeps us from doing some of these things that kind of on paper, you know, we know we're good. We know that we should be doing that, but boy, it's hard in practice. What's, what's the barrier? Of, do I address this? And then we kind of go back to the same old problem. You know, I bring something up and we go through these patterns and yeah, you would bring up, you know, every few months I'll bring this up and you say it's going to change, but then it doesn't. And then we're just kind of back in these patterns and it doesn't get resolved or we don't really come to a conclusion even when we're in the conversation. Good. Do you have one over here? Um, the time it takes that, you know, it takes time to slow down, to listen, to make time and space for each other. Sometimes life is demanding. We don't always have time to do things and think through things um, the way we might want to say it or take enough time to be careful in how we're approaching something. Absolutely. Is there another one? Yeah. Difference in personality was one of our points, you know, so some folks are more direct, they're a little more blunt, they might just kind of step in it before they've really thought through how they want to say it, not with an intention necessarily of hurting the person on the other side, but just kind of pushing into it, correct? Okay. And then the other one, say yours again, because it just went right out of my head, so it just disappeared from my brain. Um, so choosing your battles, yeah, deciding, you know, and I think that kind of shows up in a couple of areas, both on topic, but also on person. You know, sometimes there are folks where you just decide, I'm not willing to invest in, in this relationship. You know, if it's got other issues, I don't trust that we can have an honest, mutual, timely discussion. I don't trust that they're going to listen and really try to understand because of whatever's went on. And so I may or may not choose to address it because of, again, who the person is or what the topic is. It may not feel like it's important enough. But over time, is it something where I'm doing that stamp collecting, where I'm kind of holding on to those little hurts, and eventually, is it going to build towards something that's going to have to be addressed or is going to become a wedge in that relationship? Absolutely. So sometimes we're just unsure of what to say. You know, even when we kind of know what the problem is, it's hard to figure out, how do I put it in words? You know, if I'm feeling ignored by a friend, well, you know, you're not my partner, so you don't have to do this, and you don't really have but I'm really hurt and I feel really lonely and you're supposed to be one of my closest friends. I don't even know how to sometimes articulate, you know, what is it that's lacking and what's missing and what do I need? Um, sometimes that fear of response, you know, we're talking about some of that, the conflict, the worry of where is it going to go? Um, sometimes the worry that it's going to open up other conversations or other problems that may feel bigger or scarier. Looking at past patterns repeating and that's where when the online person was given the comment around, um, lack of resolution, that's part of what I went to as well with that was that idea of, you know, again, do we have these conversations, but nothing really changes, and how much energy am I willing to keep putting into that we're going to have the conversation again, and what's it going to look like? And then different communication styles, that goes back a little bit to that practicing the pause piece, you know, of how many folks, you know, need to internally sort of process a little bit, how many folks need to be able just to say what they're thinking and be that external processor. Um, for some folks, especially if it's new information, they may need to kind of step away for a little bit, like, I think about this, and can we come back together? You know, you may be someone who needs that, like, ooh, this was a big thing. I need to sort of process this a little bit before I say something I don't want to say. Um, so depending on, you know, kind of what those different communication styles are, that can be its own very you know, if in, especially if it's someone that you're still kind of figuring out what our styles are, mesh together, um, but sometimes that can get us off track. Any other stuff that came up for you as you were thinking of these? Oh gosh, that's such a good one. I think that is such a great one because how often does that happen? I mean, how often is that part of miscommunication? We think that we are completely clear. In my head, I meant this, so I said this, and then you heard this. Or God help us all, an email, an email or a text. I wrote this and I thought it was fine and now all of a sudden we're in like World War III and somebody's upset, okay? 
so yeah, being able to, oh yeah, being there. Good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and it is, it can be a real challenge because, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me repeat for the folks online because I forgot to do that. But we were talking about when you have physical hearing issues. You know, when somebody can't hear something or you're having to ask to be repeated and we want to be compassionate and supportive, but then, it, right, they guess and sort of fill in the blank of what's actually being said or we're not actually catching everything with one another. Um, one of the big things I would say there is making sure that we make time to be face-to-face, -face, that we actually are seeing and within sort of range of each other a little bit. Um, making sure that we aren't doing kind of throwaway comments, you know, things that, again, I know they're probably not going to hear this, but oh God, again, you know, and because that doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for me to say that. It doesn't humbling something, but not being able to pick it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a good point. Um, he was talking about when someone's got a hearing issue or we suspect someone that we're communicating with does, we may speak louder, which may make us come across as angry or more aggressive than we want to come across. And so we, we need to think about that. I think that's a great point. I'm so glad you all brought those aspects up because I think they're just parts we don't think about. And again, it's when it's present in that circle and in that relationship, it, it's a factor. Definitely. Good. Other thoughts on those? All right. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, so communication. How does your body feel when communication is not going well? And I'm gonna click these up and then we'll see if we got other ones. Oops. So we can feel that tension and tightness. Anybody else get that stomach tightness when you know there's something that needs to be done or said and we don't want to? Um, sweaty, shaky, sometimes numb. You know, just, I can't really think about this. I can't really feel how this is gonna be when I try to bring up this topic with somebody. Um, that adrenaline and cortisol, those stress hormones that flow through us, we're not feeling at our best when communication's off track. And when we think back a minute ago when we were talking about that, you know, do I get too focused on what am I going to say versus listening to the other person? Well, if I'm feeling like this, I'm real focused on me. What am I saying? How, how am I going to word this? What are they going to say to me? I'm my most understanding space when I'm there. On our brain and our emotions, feeling distracted. You know, if communication's off track with somebody important in your life, it, it bleeds into other areas. You know, we think about that. We wonder, you know, why isn't this working? What's going on? What am I doing wrong? How are we not meeting each other's needs? We can feel hurt, angry, sad. We can draw those incorrect conclusions. And I think some of that comes back to some of the hearing stuff we were just talking about. But, you know, we can sometimes feel like somebody doesn't care about us because of how that communication's happening. If we are talking to somebody who needs more of that pause and needs to slow down, does it feel like they're brushing us off or putting us off or not wanting to talk to us? Is that actually what's happening? I don't know. So I want to use the I statements for a second. I want us to, to talk through this one just for a couple of examples. Again, I think we hear I statements, but then being able to translate that into like an actual conversation and what do I do with it. So this is just, you know, that top kind of sentence that's there. You're so unreliable. You never follow through with anything you say you're going to do. How many of us would feel great hearing that from a friend? You know, oh, okay, that's a, puts me, because I'm going to go on the defensive. That's a, right where I'm going to go. No, I don't. I follow through with stuff sometimes, you know. So when we look at this format below, I use this a whole lot with folks individually. When we're kind of talking through how do we practice for conversations or how do we get ready to address something that we're worried about. I use this framework all the time with folks. Even if you don't say those words in this order and in this way, boy, it really will help you get down to the heart of what it is you're trying to say. Because if you can fill this in in your head, and then you go into that conversation, you've gotten to what the core is that you're trying to get to. Remember we talked about, you know, we fill space with more and more words. We try to make, we get bigger and bigger because we don't really know how to get to the heart of what we need to say. This will help you boil it down to that. So what's the way? Will somebody take a shot at translating that top sentence into this bottom format? Now, because you don't follow through on what you say you're going to do, or I feel, was it left out? Ignored. Yeah. Um, and I want you to follow through. I want you to, to tell me if you can't do something, just tell me, you know, because it, it hurts when you don't. Thinking about the one when you were talking about prioritizing, um, it was the example that I use a lot with this one. Um, somebody who constantly cancels plans. You know, you've got you've got a plan to meet for lunch. You know, you see some friend on campus that you want to stay in touch with and you plan to meet for lunch and it never fails that they always cancel at the last minute, you know. So how's that going? I think that's kind of a similar one of yeah, I feel like I'm not important to you because this is happening and it's last minute. 
I want you, I want to be able to spend time with you. I like being with you. It's really important that we see each other. That we see each other. I'm willing to keep setting this time aside, but I need to see that from you. You know, so when we think of those I statements, it's a little more than just I feel this way. There's a little more that's kind of in there. Okay, really using this format truly when you're thinking about a difficult conversation or a difficult thing you want to bring up with someone, use this to help get your thoughts together. And again, whether you use that in the words you say or whether it's a slightly different version, it's up to you. But I tell you, it will, it will help get your thoughts clarified. Okay, boundaries. So we're going to switch to those. And I'm watching time. We should be good. So this is kind of a big, lengthy description here. I'm going to read through it for us. A boundary is an imaginary line that separates me from you. They separate your physical space, feelings, needs, responsibilities from others. Your boundaries also tell people how they can treat you, what's acceptable and what's not. Okay? When we think about boundaries, when I bring that up and you think about having and setting boundaries in your life, what kind of thoughts come to mind just when you hear that or when you think about doing that with somebody? Out of your way. Absolutely. Because if I'm setting a limit, what if you don't like that limit? What if the person doesn't want to do the things I'm asking them to do? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a piece of risk in setting boundaries. There is. I mean, there's, to me, there's no escaping that. Now, I think the bigger risk is if we don't do it, you know, if we don't do it and the problems it's going to cause, and we'll get to some of those. But it can feel really risky, and it can feel scary. Other thoughts that come to mind. Does anybody have any positive thoughts when you think of boundaries? Because I think most of us don't. I mean, most of the time folks go to kind of a, ooh, that's going to feel like I'm punishing them or I'm not letting them do something they want to do or I'm telling them that I'm not okay with this. So, so we come into sort of even this piece of the discussion with some negative sort of perceptions, even though we might know in our sort of logic brain the boundaries can be healthy, they don't always feel welcoming. You know, it feels a little scary or off-putting, okay? knowing that the folks that we're talking with on the other side of these relationships have not set through this program. And so for them, they may have some also some really negative ideas about boundaries. All right. Why do we need them? They allow us to be our true self. They're a form of self-care. They create some of those realistic expectations. Remember we talked about that earlier. And they create safety. And again, when I'm saying safety, I'm using it more broadly than physical safety. They create the ability to be able to share really important things that you don't want shared with other people. And you know with this person, you all have an agreed boundary that you all don't share what you talk about with your partners or with other people in your circle. Allowing us to be our true self. If for me, if a friend has to show up in our relationship and they have to twist themselves into somebody they're not to think they've got to be okay with me, that's not, that's not what I want for them or for our friendship. You know, I want them to be able to be themselves. And so if I want that for the other person, I also want that for me. You know, it's okay for us to want to show up and be ourselves and be seen for who we are. That's how we get to that deeper connection. Because, you know, if Azetta and I are friends and I put on a certain face for her every time we see each other and things are just a certain way and I don't let her see behind the curtain. If I know that she likes me or I think, you know, she's my friend, she supports me, she likes me. What version of me does she like and support? She supports that storefront version, that cleaned up, perfect, you know, not having a problem version, because I'm not letting her see the messy version of me. I'm not letting her see who I really am, okay? I love a couple of these quotes on boundaries. So boundaries define us. They define what is me and what is not me. A boundary shows me where I end, someone else begins, leading me to a sense of ownership, knowing what I'm to own and take responsibility for gives me freedom. When I know what I've got to do, and I know what's not my responsibility, then I can put my energy on the stuff that I can control and what I'm responsible for. When I'm trying to control somebody else and make them do something I'm wanting them to do, it's not going to work. I'm just telling you, it's going to eat all your energy up and it's going to really tank a relationship. So what keeps us from, oh, see, you saw an early one there. What keeps us from setting boundaries? We talked a little bit about um, Lauren's idea back there around just, again, the risk, the fear piece of it that comes with it. What else? because of a particular role, you know, that may be because you're a parent or you're an older sibling or you're just kind of that people-pleasing friend that's always there, you know, whenever something goes bad, Nancy shows up and she's always so helpful and we really appreciate it, you know. Sometimes that can take on part of our, our identity, you know. I'm the one that shows up and helps. I'm the one that can handle a whole lot of stuff, okay. We're going to come back to that in a second. You may not get the results that you want because you can't control what's happening on the other side of setting that boundary. When you're setting a limit, and saying, you know, let's think of a good one. You know, I can't come over every night after work and, you know, see, I can come over two nights after work and that's as much time as I've got. We don't know how that other person's going to respond because, you know, the response could be, well, then don't come over at all. 
fine. You don't want to come by and see me every night? Fine, I'll find somebody who does, you know, whatever version of that. There is definitely some unpredictability because we cannot control the other side of that relationship, okay? And that's why when it comes back to the boundary piece, and as we keep going through these, you'll see, it, it's about us. It's what do I need to set for myself so that I can be okay in this relationship? And it's with, with that inability to predict where is it going to be, how's it going to be received on the other side and how they're going to respond. I realize the risk with this, but the risk of not setting them is a significant one as well. Sometimes it's feeling unworthy. Again, this is, this maybe is my role in the family. This is my role in our friend group. Um, everybody else helped me out at different times and now I need to really step up. That people pleasing, lots of us are people pleasers. Again, the intention there is not a bad one. We want to make other people happy or we want to do things that kind of fulfill a need they might have. But what does it turn into? You know, well, if it turns into an expectation, that's a real breeding ground for resentment. You know, now I'm always expected to do all these different things. Or I'm always expected to change my plans to match your plans. Okay. That, um, again, the resentment, not going to take us anywhere good in that relationship. Other things that keep us from setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yep. How to say no, when to say yes. One of my favorite folks, and I've got a quote of hers coming up in a minute, um, is Brene Brown. And if you all have not followed her, for the, oh, just please do. Like, do yourself a favor and go listen to her, like, right now. Um, and it's Brene, B-R-E-N-E, -E, Brown. One of the things she said, and this it was a couple years ago I saw it, and it's the simplest thing, but it has been so true. And it's one of those that stays right in the front for me. And it's that every time I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something else. And that is such a simple idea. Like, it's, I love just the simplicity of it. But, oh, my gosh, we don't think about that. Because we think about the trade of, well, I don't have anywhere else I have to be right now, so I could go do this, okay? Maybe what you're saying no to is getting enough sleep that night, you know, if you're staying up late and cooking for everybody under the sun or whatever it is. Maybe it's not getting enough time doing homework with your kid. Other things that could still function without you there, but you're saying no to them to say yes to whatever this thing is. Now, if you want to do that, that's fine. But it's, it's that intentional, purposeful Am I choosing where I want to put my energy in the way that, I, that lines up with who I am and what's important to me? Because again, if I'm saying yes when I don't want to, how am I going to feel? Resentful. Who's resentful? You know, absolutely. It's a breeding ground for it, and we all will feel that. And it, again, doesn't have to even be things that feel huge, but when we constantly are feeling like we're not stepping into what we truly, honestly want to be doing and setting those limits we need to, and we're not saying no when we need to, then we're going to get off track. So when we talk about building and preserving boundaries, kind of how to do that. Oops. Oh, yep. Let me just click all these up. Sorry. Okay. So being able to name your limits. And sometimes that takes some work. You know, sometimes really being able to kind of get down and drill down to what is it that's kind of off here? Because you can sort of know and you're feeling some of those problems with communication, but you can't always kind of get your finger on it. That can be a time where it's helpful to either process that with another friend, come in and talk to somebody like me or Anne, you know, just to kind of think through, okay, what needs to change with this? How do I kind of get my thoughts together? So a lot of times we have these, I'd always describe them as sort of these tornadoes of thought and emotion, you know, all these different swirling things that are going around and trying to get it down to, okay, how do I talk about that? Though? Like, how do I actually bring it up? What's the core of what it is I'm trying to say to that person? Um, so being able to, to get to the words to know what your limits are, tuning into your feelings excuse me, by that I just mean listen to your gut. You know, some of those early things we talked about, you know, the stomach upset and the sweaty and the shaky and feeling uncomfortable. Okay, that's your body and your gut just kind of screaming. Something is off track here, okay? Doesn't mean we have to throw the whole relationship out the window, but something's not lining up the way we need it to, all right? Being direct, you know, and we talked a little bit about being direct and, and you know, balancing that with, um, what's a good word for it, some caution or some, you know, awareness of how that's going to land with other folks. But we also, if we get into a place where we're talking about limits and boundaries, we also don't want to beat around the bush. Like if we're going to have a conversation and I really am saying, I cannot come by your house every night to say hello on my way home, I need to get to that point. Because if I'm just dancing around it and filling it up with other words that aren't what I'm trying to say, I've went through this whole process, 
I've also given the other person in that relationship the message that, okay, this is what the problem is, and we're feeling, we're fixing it or we're working on it. If that's not what's really going on, then I'm just kind of undermining the whole, the whole situation or the whole um, effort. Giving yourself permission to do it, you know, knowing that, again, sometimes that's some work of, I deserve a space at the table. Um, that's another one that I'll share with you that I use with clients a whole lot. I don't know if anybody else grew up with grandparents like mine. My grandparents were wonderful. My grandmother's cooked like nobody's business. How much would I love to sit down to one of their meals right now? Um, but my, one well, of my grandmothers, I mean, she never sat at the table. She never sat at the table. She just like buzzed around the kitchen and like everybody else would do rotations. We had a big family. And I'd always be like, sit down. Let's just sit. Join us. It's the same idea. Join us. You deserve a seat at the table. You deserve to get your needs met too. When we're talking about people pleasing, we're talking about showing up for other folks, you deserve a seat at the table too. You know, don't be my grandma. My grandma was a good cook, but she never got to eat when things were hot. Okay. You deserve a seat at the table. Your needs matter in this whole scheme of things too. Practicing that self-awareness. Again, knowing most of the time, um, I would say I probably probably never met anyone who's perfect. I'm going to go there. Um, and so even when we're in counseling and folks will come in and they'll be like, well, I'm not perfect. Pat, I never thought you were. No, so you're not perfect and your partner's not perfect or your friend's not perfect. But getting some self-awareness. What do I do to contribute to this? How many times, you know, when they say, are you sure you're okay coming by tonight after work? And I go, yeah, of course. When in my head, I'm going, God, no. Okay. If I'm not, if I'm not showing up, if I'm not being honest, I'm setting, I've got some, some stuff in this too. Okay, most of us are not perfect. Most communication problems and boundary issues are coming because both sides in that relationship or all sides in the relationship um, are sometimes struggling with aspects of it. Making self-care a priority. Again, you deserve a seat at the table. I mean, that's just what it comes back to. And I'm telling you, keep that thought in your head as you leave here because I think it's one of the things, places we shortchange ourselves so much. Um, nobody else is necessarily even pushing us to do it. I wanted my grandma to sit down and come join us, okay? Other people in our worlds who love us and care about us and are in relationships with us, they don't want to be doing things that are hurtful to us, okay? It's, but if we don't show up, if we're, not, if we're not open about what's going on, we aren't letting them give, give, we are not letting them step up to support us the way they might want to. Seeking support, when I was talking about, you know, again, talk this over, have a trusted friend or come in to see somebody and kind of talk about how do I want to approach this or what do I want to do with it? And starting small, you know, this doesn't have to be, okay, I'm going to tackle the biggest, hugest, scariest, most important thing ever. No, I would suggest with these things, start with little things, you know, identifying some small thing, using that I statement, you know, kind of framework, thinking through, okay, I've wanted to bring this up with somebody for a little while. How could I actually start with that piece? Because this feels small. And if they don't respond great, I can handle it. It's not great, but I can handle that. Okay. Oh, Brene Brown, I love you. Daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. And honestly, that, that's, to me, the best summary of it that I can, can come across. Because typically that's where our biggest hindrance comes. We don't want to hurt people. We're scared of the conflict. We're worried about the implications. Yeah, this is a problem in our relationship now, but if I shine some light on it and bring it up, what if it really blows up? What if we don't talk to each other again? You know, what if that person cuts me off? What if they're not willing, because really what it comes back to, what if they're not willing to see me as important enough to invest in this relationship and to do something different? And that's scary. And that's scary for all of us, whoever's on the other side of that. But the thing is, if we stay stuck there and if we keep that fear is what leads the way, we're never going to get to that deeper connection. We're never going to get to seeing who's behind the curtain, you know? Because again, if Azetta and I are friends and I let her know, yeah, I'm really struggling with something. You know, I'm in this space and this is what's going on. I don't need anybody to fix it, but like I need to legitimately share with you something that's there. Then she can legitimately support me. She can see who I am and she can be supportive and be a friend to that. It, that vulnerability is inherent in all of this, you know, and I think it's probably, for me, it's probably the thing I see most that folks struggle with is that fear of what's, what's the potential negative outcome of me bringing up something or trying to do this differently. Um, and I think sometimes we have to look at what's the potential benefit. Where can we grow in this relationship? You know, how can we be closer? How can we understand each other? How can we have places where I can say, are we okay? Okay. Are we good? Do we check in? We're checking in regularly. And it doesn't have to be the stamp collecting. It doesn't have to be I've waited two years until I'm so hurt by something that I'm just responding out of hurt. 
we're doing it along the way because we're setting boundaries and we're talking. It will not be perfect. It won't. You'll stumble into stuff. You'll put your foot in it sometimes. You'll say things in a way that's harsher than what you wanted to. But by doing it and by engaging in the things we've talked about, that's where you get connection. That's where you get that deeper level, okay? Next well-being presentation. Tammy, anything I need to say about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's the next one coming up. And that's, um, let's see, November 29th. You can do it online via Zoom. Sleep well, create sleep habits that work for you. Heck yeah. I like sleep. Okay. And then this is just a few pictures from the work-life office. I don't have everybody in there because I was doing this at the last minute, shock. Um, but at least some of our folks that, that work with me over there and some of the things that we do. If it feels like some of this um, resonates for you or it feels like you might want to talk about it a little more, again, a little deeper, or kind of make an individual plan around how to address some of those things, feel free to come in and talk with us. You know, all